Hey guys, it's Gary again. Uh, been away for a while. Um, I'm slacking off, what can I tell you? Uh, got a couple things going on. Um, I don't know if you guys remember my uh, couple videos I made in my garage. Uh, music studio, uh, what else? Oh, driving in my car and stuff like that. Um, I have an, an Amazon Fire, which is a little internet device that you can film on as well, which is my primary reason for buying it. I don't have a smartphone, so my primary reason for getting it was to be able to uh, do some videos when I'm driving around and stuff like that. And um, I've been doing a, a couple trips, nothing special, but I attempted to film to kind of do some gap videos in between me kind of slacking off here. And um, I've had trouble with the fire. I bought it in January, and I'm sorry I didn't return it. It's a piece of junk. Don't don't buy it. That's my advice. Um, I go I go on Amazon. I see people great ratings for it, but I've had nothing but problems with that with that unit. Um, I tried to record some uh, some videos. It's a really really nice blue sky in the last several days, and I've been out like three days recently, which is more than I typically go out in a week. Um, and uh, tried to film some videos of uh, a trip. I, I made a trip about a half hour from home today. Um, tried to uh, tried to film me driving by my old house, which has been knocked down. So um, it's literally the first time I've seen it since the house was torn down. I lived there for over 50 years. Um, tried to film that, but the um, the unit kept on crapping out on me and turning itself off every minute or two. So. Um, I wanted to get some video of that, and uh, just kind of as a gap filler video, um, but also out on the highway. The sky was blue and beautiful, and I was playing some Harold Weiss music, and I thought it would be a great soundtrack. And uh, the damn thing like kept on shutting off every minute or two on me, so I couldn't. You know, I've got all these one and two minute videos. I don't think are really worth posting. Um, if I find one that's got a couple minutes and maybe some Harold Weiss soundtrack music with a nice visual, maybe I might put that chunk up. But um, you know, I was gonna I was gonna put up a 30-minute video of just driving down the road listening to Harold Weiss music until I can uh, do my review, which keeps on getting interrupted by people being too kind to me. Uh, first, I had uh, Andrew send me eight CDs, and um, not that I was, wasn't was already slacking off uh, getting to my Harold Weiss video, but that really kind of put it on the back burner. Um, just about to get back to it, and what arrives in the mail today is some um, VCLT from Jeff, who really went out of his way. Uh, we're talking about the, um, the uh, I say Italian, I don't know how to say Italian, the French, French progressive rock group Pulsar. Um, we started a conversation that Jeff had um, done a video where he showed at least one of his recordings back, I don't know, a month or something, probably more than a month ago now. And um, we got on a whole discussion because we both have, neither one of us speak French. And um, one of their albums has a lot of dialogue in French and people yelling and all that. And we didn't understand what it was all about. And Jeff kind of went out of his way to find out what the whole what this whole story was, because uh, unusual for Pulsar, which is a, a progressive rock band that started in the uh, mid-70s, kind of Pink Floyd-ish, um, which I particularly love this band. I, I like them better than Pink Floyd, actually. Um, and it's weird because they, they recorded albums, uh, I want to say their first album, like, I think they recorded the first album like 75, they did another one in 76, they did another one in 77, and then nothing. Uh, and then they did one album in the early 80s, I want to say about 81, then nothing again until, uh, what is that, when is the, um, I forget when it was, Jeff, when's that one with all the French yelling on it? It's basically, it's almost like it was a, essentially, which we didn't know at the time when we bought it, not so much a Pulsar music album as it sounds like it's a soundtrack to a play almost. Um, and Jeff, Jeff found somebody who knew what the whole story was and deciphered it or knows French or whatever. Um, and they've only come out with, uh, I forget when that album came out, early 90s I want to say? Uh, and then they came out with one I think 2006. And oddly enough, even though they're not a, obviously they're not a full-time band, they have, you know, in, in since uh, they recorded three albums, one a year, set, what, 75, 76, 77, and then they've only recorded three albums since then, spread out over many years, so I don't know what the other musicians do, but oddly enough, of the five musicians in the band, um, four of the members have stayed constant 
all the way going back to their first album. Uh, only only uh, bass players essentially been been replaced by guests over the years. But it's kind of weird for a band that's obviously not um, earning their sole living from from being in that band. Um, it's interesting that that sometimes they don't get together for ten years, and yet when they do, there's four of the original members are there. It's pretty incredible. Um, and honestly, I guess it was that conversation that I, I started having with Jeff um, about Pulsar uh, that I have. Um, I only bought one of their their first three albums, which are kind of their core progressive rock stuff. Um, I only bought one of those on CD over the years, and I don't even know why I bought the one that I did because it wasn't my favorite out of the three. I must have got a good deal on it or something. Um, and the one that I like the most, I still haven't bought on CD actually, but it is here on YouTube in its entirety, and I am going to try to remember to include a link so not only can you hear it, but you can see it, because the, the purpose of this video is, um, I had mentioned to Jeff that um, when I moved out of my old house, I had several boxes of vinyl, old vinyl albums in the basement that I left behind, and the house has been torn down now. Um, I kind of intentionally left them behind. A lot of them were really worn and old. A lot of it was rock and roll stuff I didn't listen to. And the, the mistake that I made is the few that I really kind of would have wanted to keep, um, I didn't pull out of the basement years ago, because the basement is kind of damp, and it may have not even been the case, but I kind of got this this thing in my head that the um, that the, the records probably got uh, the the covers from from it being so damp, and then every once in a while it would flood. Now it didn't affect the records; the records were off the floor, but um, it was so damp. I kind of got this this vibe in my head that um, the record jackets probably absorbed like this mildewy stuff, and so you know, like old newspapers. So I so I just left them behind. The one that I mentioned to Jeff that I wish I had taken with me uh, is my Pulsar album, Strands of the Future, which is the first album I bought by them, and an excellent uh, 1970s era progressive rock, which is, you know, music that I don't really, I don't seek it out anymore. Um, my era of listening to most progressive rock is kind of over, and um, I, I kind of find a lot of it now, like I was never really a fan of Emerson Like a Palmer except for one of their albums. Um, I found them a bit too pompous and overblown. Um, I still like a lot of um, like Genesis, like Wind and Wuthering, Trespass, stuff like that. Um, but there's, but I don't really go seek it out anymore. And I know there's some '70s bands that I miss that I potentially would have liked, but um, I've kind of moved on to other stuff with rare exception. And one of those exceptions that I was pining away to Jeff was this Pulsar album, The Strands of the Future, which you can buy on CD, and I intend to buy it on CD um, to get a, you know, a better quality pressing of the music. Um, but I found it here on YouTube. The album is in full, and I'm going to include a link on there, so not only can you listen to it, because to this day I still can listen to this album, and I love it. Um, full of analog synthesizers. They sound a bit like, um, a, a little bit like maybe Pink Floyd, um, but but their their main focus is primarily the keyboards. Wonderful, wonderful sounding analog synth, and a little dark progressive music too. Um, and if you're familiar with the Italian band Goblin that does a lot of movie soundtracks, um, the music reminds me probably maybe a bit more like Goblin, the Italian band, than Pink Floyd. Because um, Goblin also was a very heavy synthesizer band. You know, the, the keyboard player is really the main guy in, in this band. Um, and um, I would have been happy if the cover of the Pulsar Strands of the Future wasn't so great. I would be happy to have a CD of it. And unfortunately, I left that album in my basement. And I mentioned it to Jeff. I said, You know, Jeff, man, I'm sorry. That's the one album that I should have grabbed. What does he do? He goes out and he buys me a copy on LP, which I'm blown away by, and I really, I can't, I can't thank you enough. Here it is. Now, hopefully you'll see the co the cover, but if you go to the link that I'm going to include so you could really see a, a good photo of the, the full album cover, it's just a bizarre cover. Now, you have to realize that when I bought this in the late 70s, this is long before the days of digital music. So, unless you heard the music on the radio, um, 
and most of this music probably wasn't even played on France in the radio. Forget about the U.S. Um, your, your first exposure to it was probably in a record store or through somebody's record collection, and you would see the cover first. And the cover is something very important to this because I wonder what my impression of the... I, I would have liked the music, even if I hadn't seen the cover, but because I saw the cover first, and at the time I was very much into progressive rock, um, and I was looking for new progressive rock bands, and just by looking at the cover, I had the vibe that that's what this was, you know, and I'm kind of happy that it didn't turn out to be like an Alice Cooper record or something. Um, but I saw this in the import bins at Sam Goody. I still remember where I got it. And I said, I, I, I got to get that. That album cover is so cool. I hope the music is as cool inside. And there's this... This looks like a wooden fence. This cover makes very little sense. Uh, it's open to a lot of interpretation. This looks like a wooden fence. And all these little white... There's just like hundreds of flies that are attracted to this white stuff that's stuck to this wooden fence. I have no idea what that white stuff is, except for the album's called The Strands of the Future, so maybe that white stuff is The Strands of the Future. The prior album to this was called Pollen, P-O-L-L-E-N, so in my mind, I think maybe that white stuff is pollen and these flies are attracted to it and they're gonna go off and make a new generation of human creatures or creatures, whatever. And see, so all these creatures are, are kind of staring at this, at this fence these kind of creatures coming from out of outer space, or whatever they are, these bold humanoid things, um, are staring at this, this wooden fence filled with this pollen, white stuff, and these flies. And at first, on the front cover, it looks like they're kind of curiously looking at it. When you flip it over, though, it's a little more intense. It's more like, it's more like an attack of these creatures, because there's a new... This is just a fantastic cover. And it's so dark. Um... A bit like H.P. Lovecraft, if you're, if you're, this is very much like a, if they were to try, to, to make an attempt to make a, a poster or a book cover that kind of gets the vibe of H.P. Lovecraft's stories, um, here's a good start. And I love that cover, I love the, I love the colors, the blues, uh, these creatures, See, it looks a lot more ominous in the back because these creatures look a lot more, um, more like they're, in invasion or attack mode than they are here, where they look like they're kind of curiously looking at whatever this, the strands of the future are. Um, but that, and that cover comes, it still comes off pretty well on the CD. Oh, now my computer's doing the fritz again. Um, um what's inside? And that's, that's bizarre that probably you, you don't see um, so much on the, uh, in the CD booklet because it's going to be a very small... Is There's two creatures, two, like a male and a female, that are hanging by essentially what looks like almost a, a marionette's... What he calls marionette things there. You can see the, the center of their body is hollow except for some kind of strands of, I don't know if they're bones or what, and they're kind of like holding each other's inner bones. It, it's a really bizarre thing, and there's all these, this march going on down below. This is just so wonderfully bizarre. Um, and, let me see, and there's a hand that's just pinned to the wall there. This is like a nightmare, but a very cool nightmare. And on both sides, in, in the upper corner, you have this window that I'm, I'm trying to this is on both sides of the album, so it almost looks like they're in a basement there. And out the window, you see what looks like the sea. And that's on both sides of the album there. You can see it there. I can't, I cannot get this coordinated here. There we go, you see there. And now, you see, you see, you see that hand there? You see this electric plug? This is just one of those bizarre things that I never, for, I hadn't even looked at this for 20 some odd years and I remembered every detail of what's in there and then here goes Todd there's a guy smoking a doobie which kind of tells you maybe where this image came from this is just so wonderfully bizarre I love it I love it it brings up an interesting question though uh, and, and by the way the, co the, the cover images uh, was designed uh, by an artist but also by one of the guys in the band um 
but it brings it brings up an interesting question because um, the cover image kind of I wouldn't say tainted but colored my impression of the music um, by seeing that bizarre cover image obviously in the record store prior to hearing the music uh, as soon as I, I kind of expected the music to be kind of dark and weird and it's definitely progressive rock but um, you know it's got some dark synthesizer tones to it really nice synthesizer tones but because the, I, I believe I let the cover art color my perception of the music and I wonder if that's ever happened to you guys out there um, because um, it just struck me. I probably looked at this quite a few times before I actually purchased it. And that cover gives off such a weird vibe that um, I couldn't help it, but as soon as I put on the music, and there's, a, there's very little vocal, there's some vocal in there. I believe it's sung in English, oddly enough. Uh, and English is definitely a second language, but it's so echoey and reverberations going on. Um, and the lyrics are not really that important to the music, um, thankfully. It's mostly, I'd uh, say, 90% instrumental and you can really listen to the vocals um, just like they were an instrument uh, usually only happens in, in oddly enough some quiet sections where there's acoustic guitar and stuff uh, but if you're a, a prog fan and it's not pretentious it's not over loud at all um, the, the keyboards are fantastic it was kind of like if uh, if Klaus Schultz from the you know the the first f five or six or seven albums of his um, was in a, a in a progressive rock band kind of and more like the leader of that band it's kind of that vibe a lot of those synthesizer textures that I hear from the early Klaus Schultz albums uh, I wonder what these guys get up to because obviously they're not a full-time band anymore um, they even have a website with almost no information as to what other projects they're involved in what they do so the band itself is kind of mysterious um, but I love that album and I can listen to it online until I get the CD I'm not even going to attempt to play the vinyl I don't think I might I might end up doing it uh, but um, I am like I said I'm going to include the link so you guys can see and hear it for yourself and the link actually if you listen through it has pictures of uh, somebody actually had the, the gatefold album and they opened it and you could see the front and back cover and the center spread the gatefold spread um, actually while you listen to the album and if you're not interested in listening to the album you could skip ahead every five minutes or so and see some some pictures of it um, so you can see the pictures that I showed just in case they're not so clear and see see if in your mind um, I don't know if, if they if they had a real normal record album cover like the band standing there amongst their instruments or something like that. I don't know if I would perceive the album as being as uh, I say weird. It's not really weird, as odd as it is. Um, but the cover gives it such a vibe that you go into the music and you kind of let that color your impression of the music. Which brings me to it. So I, I got I got to thank Jeff. He you know he didn't even give me this out of his personal collection I was simply talking about how much I was sorry that I didn't take that original vinyl with me and uh, he went out and he bought me a copy which is totally I, I totally appreciate it's totally unnecessary it's a sweet gesture um, and I and I do appreciate it but all you guys that send me stuff um, and have sent me stuff or want to you don't have to I really appreciate it you guys are my friends you're wonderful you don't have to send me stuff um, I appreciate everything that's been sent and I haven't got gotten a, a bum thing yet you know or something that I wouldn't be listening to in the future um, but it's totally not necessary that's not why I do these videos or anything like that um, but man, I'm, I'm floored when I got this. I, I, I Jeff told me he sent me something, but I just never, I just never thought. You know, we had all these pulsar conversations. Um, but, but but looking at that album cover made me think of a, of a few things uh, in terms of album covers. I kind of went down this path a little bit before, but I figured I would just amend my video with this since I haven't done one for a while. And that is, um, I've done it uh, a thing of albums I bought just because I liked the cover. This kind of is similar to that, but in most of the cases, well, I'll just show it. Um, I bought this one because I like the cover, and I didn't show it because I, I actually have this in a frame. I like it so much. Makoto Ozone. Um, this is such a beautiful album cover, and you can't see it with the glare, unfortunately. Um, but it's a pier. I don't know where, but it's a picture of a pier, 
I would like it better if there was no one standing there, if, the, if it was without the people. But it's beautiful. It's a picture of the pier with the lights there. And this is his second solo album. I can't see the back of it now because the back of it's covered in the frame. Um, and I, I bought this because I love the album cover. Um, and again, I like the album cover so much that I almost let it convince me that I would like the album in a way. It's a uh, Now, I knew who Makoto Ozone was. He was a Berkeley student, I believe Japanese, um, who went to Berkeley where Gary Burton was teaching and became a part of Gary Burton's ensemble. So he, he, he recorded quite a few albums in the ECM years as the pianist for Gary Burton in his um, quartet and quintet. I think he was in a five-piece, too. Very heavily Chikoria influenced. I'm not a fan of Chikoria because I, I think his playing is too busy. I've got a ton of his albums, but for me personally, I find his playing too busy. I find Makoto Ozone's playing a little bit too busy because he's so heavily influenced by Chikoria. But I actually like him better than Chikoria because he's not as busy. He's also influenced by other mainstream jazz pianists. He's got a bunch of solo albums out. This was the second one. I bought his first one on vinyl also. Uh, his first one was interesting because it was a trio with Eddie, I think it was Eddie Gomez on bass, Gary Burton on vibes, and Makoto Ozone just on piano, no drums. Very chamberish. Um, that's a really good album, too. Very much like um, the albums, the duet albums that um, Gary Burton recorded with Chick Corea, like Crystal Silence and all that, except for, in, in this case, on the M Makoto Ozone's album, uh, Eddie Gomez was on bass as well. This one was more, um, and oddly enough, as much as, you know, I generally prefer, would prefer the lineup of vibes, upright bass and piano, to what's a standard jazz trio and quartet. Um, this is just acoustic piano, upright bass and drums, and they're joined by saxophone on various tracks. Generally, I would prefer the more chamberish stuff, but in this case, I actually prefer this album better. I think the um, it's a little looser. The first Makoto Ozone album uh, with Gary Burton and Eddie Gomez is very much a written out um, thing. There's not a whole lot of improvisation on there, and it gets quite busy at times, almost like Makoto Ozone's making up for the fact that there's no drummer there and plays a lot of notes. It's still a good album, but this one with the support of the bass and drums there and on occasion saxophone, um, it breathes a little bit more. It's a little bit more like... Um, there's just more There's more space to it. Makoto Ozone lets the music breathe a little bit, doesn't play as busily. Um, and when he does it, he improvises a lot more, and it shows. It's nice. You know, you've got the bass and the drums, and the saxophone is used a bit sparingly, so it's not just there on every track. It's there on every second or third track, whenever. And I believe, I can't see the credits here because it's all covered up. The saxophone player plays, I think, um, alto and... Uh, Soprano, um, or, or is it tenor and alto? I'm not sure. But he plays a couple different saxophones, so it varies the sound nicely. And uh, there's some trio tracks, which are nice. Uh, there's an improvisation, which I believe is just piano solo. Um, but I really like this album for a lot of years. And when it first, it didn't come out on CD until the, I want to say, late 90s. And it was only available in Japan, and I sprung for it. Actually, both his first and second albums. That's ridiculous. I spent 30 something dollars for the CDs of these, which I, I don't even know where they are right now. They're, they're somewhere here. I think I, I think I stuck them with my Gary Burton stuff. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if if I, sh if I would have waited a little while, I probably could have gotten the CDs at a, at a cheaper price. But um, And they may be available, not domestically. This came out on, I think, Columbia. But um, Columbia's not really interested in, in, in jazz, really. So I don't know if they're going to release them on CD, at least in America. But um, this I really like, you know. And again, I, I wonder if I let the, the fact that I love the cover so much, I kind of let it convince me that I like the music. But it's a good mainstream acoustic jazz album anyway. But um, even if I had bought the CD prior to this, this is one of those albums I would want the LP for the cover. And that's kind of what this... Uh, I've, oh, I've got a handful here. I think I've shown all of these before. Here's another one. Now, this isn't on CD. But this is one that if I had on CD, I would still want the, the album on the 12-inch vinyl because I love the vinyl. I love that, that picture so much. Jimmy Rainey, Momentum from the 70s. Uh, here's another ECM. i got a bunch of ECM ones here. Um, and here's another ECM that never came out on CD. Adelhard Reutinger. I love that cover photo. Uh, I, didn't, I was actually looking for this album, so I didn't buy this because of the album photo. 
Um, I knew the players on here, like Mike DePasqua. Um, so I was actually looking for this. This was an import. This didn't even come out in the U.S. Um, this is one of those albums that didn't get released in the U.S. in the late early 80s. Um, but I love that cover. These I've definitely shown before. Uh, I'm glad I have these on CD now, but I bought these when they originally came out on vinyl. Azimuth 85. Very similar to the last album cover, the Adel Hard Reutinger. But I love this. I love I love that photo. Some of their th their photos are just incredible. And uh, the first Azimuth album with that, I think that's a hotel. Did somebody tell me that's a hotel? I, I think um, after I did my Azimuth video, somebody wrote me and told me this is a, ho a hotel or something. It's in the middle of water. I, I don't. Uh, but I don't know if this was the album cover they were referring to or not. But that's just a fantastic, bizarre album cover. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this because it's not on the CD reissue. Uh, the CD reissue was the first three albums packaged together, and they didn't um, include the covers, I think. I'm not sure if the booklet has black and white photos of the covers. I'd have to go look. But um, I just love that. I just love that cover. Uh, another one I've shown before. This is one Guilty. Guilty. I bought this because I love the album cover, even though I was familiar with the, uh, Richie Byrock and George Mraz because they were both uh, members of John Abercrombie's quartet. Um, Rendezvous. I don't think this ever came out on CD either. Another pier, but a dilapidated pier. And you can see that, that red sun, that, that red moon there. Um, when did this come out? This was, a, this was a, the, the, the International Phonograph Incorporated in Connecticut, USA. Um, I, this, I don't even think I have anything else on this label. That's why I don't think this ever came out on CD. Uh, this label did, probably didn't exist long. It was recorded in January 1981. It's just, um, you know, piano and bass, acoustic piano and bass. But I knew Richie and I knew George Mraz because they both played with uh, Jen Abercrombie's quartet. Uh, actually, this was recorded right after the quartet split up because I know their last album they recorded with John Abercrombie was uh, 1980, and this was done in January 81. Um, And uh, all original tracks by Richie Byrock, and um, one track written by bassist George Mraz. But I, you know, I, I okay, I was familiar with them, but when I saw the cover, I had to buy it. And uh, I think I've shown all of these. Jan Garbrick's Places, I love that photo. I don't know, that's a pretty photo, but I don't know if any of you guys are horror movie fans at all. If you've ever seen the original Night of the Living Dead from 1968, the black and white Night of the Living Dead from 1968, the movie was filmed, uh, I think in Connecticut, Connecticut? I think in the Connecticut area, in black and white. And the opening of the movie starts off on a windy country road that looks almost exactly like that. I always think of Night of the Living Dead when I first see that cover, even though there's nothing ominous about it. And this I definitely showed. This, this is, I think this is my last, my most recent vinyl purchase. Um, and I bought this just because I love the cover photo. I have this music on CD. I had this on LP on those two first sets that came out in the late, mid to late 70s. And I had the music on two or three different CDs already um, since the 90s or 80s. Um, of the material that's actually on here from the... Um, the early Miles Davis, this quintet with John Coltrane, Red Garland, Paul Chambers, Billy Joe Jones. Um, but I just bought this because I lo look at that photo. I just love that. I've shown that before. So I just wanted to connect that. Uh, Jeff, thanks, buddy. Um, I really appreciate that. Guys, I'm sorry. I've been so slow and bad with the videos. I might I might look in, into my, my Amazon thing and see if there's any... Um, I got Pulsar. Oh, Pulsar's playing in the background. I don't know how much, if any, you could hear that. I'm going to include the link to the entire album uh, for the Strands of the Future for those fans that might that are like prog rock uh, from the 70s and the analog synth sound. Um, really, really good band. Um, and whenever they get together, they got four original members still. I don't know how they do it uh, all these years later. So I'm going to include that link. And um, I'll be back with an update soon. I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try to get to that Harold Weiss video. <laughs> I'll get to it eventually. I, I was just playing his music, as a matter of fact, trying to prepare for it when the um, the vinyl came, and it's like you know, let me just let me do this video. So, guys, um, I'll I'll be back soon, and hopefully, jeez, I, oh, I went on almost a half hour here. Okay, guys, I'll be back soon. Um, hope this video wasn't a total waste of time for you. Bye.